Hi, my name is Landon Day and we are in my studio here in Mansfield, Texas. And today I wanted to show some examples of why certain lens focal lengths and why certain f-stops do what they do. What we're going to do is I've got a model coming, her name is Allie, and we're going to photograph her out here in front of the studio in natural light, no flashes, no nothing. And we're going to use anywhere from a 16 millimeter fisheye to a 200 f2 uh, Nikkor lens and we're going to try to get the same photo every time in camera meaning her head in the same spot same size relative to the rest of it so this is going to show us what the backgrounds will do what the compression of the actual focal lengths do and what the f-stops will do to the backgrounds um, as we change from 16 to 200. Um, we will also be including a layered TIFF file that you can click on and see all these guys individually and see the differences a little more hands-on at, uh, at your leisure. So as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, Landon, L-A-N-D-O-N, at daydreamphotography.net, and we'll do whatever we can to help you out. Hello, and welcome back. Now we are in... Uh, Photoshop and we're going to be showing you all the different photos that we took of Ali uh, going through the different uh, focal lengths and what the different f-stops did and how those two correlate and what they affect with each other. Um, so we're going to start off with the extreme stuff and what we've done is I've tried to take the same photo of Ali across the board where her head is roughly the same size. I didn't want to make it any more extreme than it could have been so she's going to be just off-centered um, on every photo showing what the distortion is going to do and then what the background is going to be doing over here on the left um, so this one right now is the most extreme scenario that we're going to do this was taken with a 16 millimeter Nikon fisheye and you wouldn't use this on portraits 99 percent of the time especially up this close because of the distortion that it's going to give on her face it's one thing to throw the distortion on the buildings and the walls and the roads um, but it's another thing to make her face look like it's four foot wide um, but what i did want to do is show that even though this is shot at 28 there's still quite a bit of depth of field here you can still see all the buildings in the background you can see there's a truck um, etc even though this was taken at um, 28 now the next one is going to be taken at f11 and you can see now that everything is sharper, um, but 2.8 wasn't that shallow of a depth of field because of such a wide focal length. When you're dealing with really wide focal lengths, um, your depth of field is going to be much greater, meaning there's going to be much more in focus um, compared to uh, larger focal lengths. Okay, so taking those off, now we're going to go into just a 16 millimeter um, wide angle lens. This is not a fisheye. You can tell that her face, though, is still distorted. The lines on the buildings are all pretty straight. The lines on the roof are straight now compared to the bubble effect we had earlier. Um, but it is still way too close to use as a portrait. Um, granted, you're not using wide-angle lenses most of the time on close headshots, but that's why you get this distortion if you ever do do that. This is going to show you why that is. And again, here's going to be f2.8 compared to f11. You could tell how much more gets put in focus, even though F28 still you see a truck and you still see some other details in the background. So moving off of 16 going on to 24, this is where a lot of lenses are going to be starting. Uh, you see a lot of 24 to 70 lenses. This would be on the bottom of that range. And again, this is taken at 28. You could tell that compared to 16 at 28 her face is a lot less distorted going back and forth here we're starting to get into a normal um, focal length it's still a little bit stretched but definitely nothing compared to the difference that 16 makes there going from 24 to 8 to 24 to 11 again you can see just how much more is put in focus moving on to 50 it's been called the Nifty 50 for good reasons because this is a 51.4 lens here and you could tell now we're starting to get that really creamy shallow depth of field. Her proportions are all looking much, much better. She's not being stretched. Um, this would be a very acceptable uh, focal range to do a lot of portraits with. 
I still would prefer not to do a close-up headshot with a 50, um, but the things that it's starting to do to the background and the compression that we're starting to get, it, you start seeing that more at 50 than we have at any of the wider focal lengths up to this point. Um, what I did on some of my prime lenses was I showed 50 at 1.4, I showed it at 2.8 so we could compare apples to apples with some of the other lenses and then again at f11 like we're doing the rest of the lenses. So this is what 51.4 looks like compared to 2.8. If you notice this area right in here where the lines are of the building, the edge of the awning right out here in front of the studio. Um, you can see a lot of difference on how much softer it gets at 2.8 compared to 1.4. 2.8 is a very fast f-stop, but not uh, nearly compared to what 1.4 is. And then if we take both of those off, this is f11, and again, pretty much everything is going um, in focus. Starting to get a little bit um, soft back here, but I want you to watch this area at f11 as we go from 50 to 200 to be able to see the difference on that. Now we're up to 728. This is where the edge of your zoom is going to be on that 2470 lens that everybody loves so much. And this is what it looks like at 28. Looks just fine, no distortion, um, but the background isn't as creamy as it was at the 514, um, but it's still getting very soft. And again, 50, or the 70 now at f11 is putting everything back in focus. This is the 8514 Nikon uh, G lens, and this has been called the king of bokeh. And you could tell that at 1.4 right here, it is a beautiful, beautiful lens. It's got an incredibly shallow depth of field. We're not seeing all the buildings and distractions in the background, even though they're all still there. Nothing has changed, taking the shots basically from the same spot, trying to keep the angles the same. But the awnings are even disappearing, the buildings disappearing, the cars over here to the left are all disappearing now. Going from 85.14 to 2.8, um, still quite a bit of difference, especially if you look at the edges of the details here. And that's 2.8, and that's 1.4, compared to 11, again, where everything is still getting put into focus. This is taken with a Tokina 100 macro at 2.8, and Granted, you're not using a macro lens most of the time for portraits. They're made for detail shots of things like rings or jewelry or flowers maybe in your uh, wedding photography. But shooting at with the, the 100 is a really good focal length for portraits. I'm not as big of a fan what this is doing to the backgrounds. Um, it is soft and we are getting some bokeh, but we are still keeping these hard edges, especially compared to what the 1.4 was giving us earlier. And now sliding up to F11, you're seeing everything again is put back in focus. You're starting to see it's a, a recurring statement that F11 pretty much puts everything in focus. 105 is another really common focal length, so I went ahead and included that in here. And this was taken with the 7200 VR2 Nikon lens. Um, but you can see that the background is still nice and soft, even though we're not at an extreme anything. We're at the uh, the 105, kind of in the middle of that range, but still wide open at 2.8. And again, there's F11, just throws everything back in focus back here. A lens I don't have that I would like to have is the 135 2.0 lens. So to give that same focal length, this is again on the 7200. Um, VR2 taken at 135 at 28 and we're starting to see now that real compression of the background this was um, four or five um, places down to the edge here where you can see the edge of the building stop um, and it's getting smaller and smaller as we go and I'm going to show you a little bit better comparison comparison of what that's going to look like uh, coming forward when we start seeing more of these guys side by side at their focal lengths but start noticing this line here and where that line ends up going forward and there's your F11 back in focus you can see how much closer that line got here this is at um, 200 millimeters at F2 and we're starting to see all that compression is really jammed in there. She's still super sharp and the background is just completely melted away. 
this is with the 200 and of the 7200 lens. Um, a lot of people have the question of why would you spend so much more money to get the 200 f2 compared to what the 200 on the end of the 2.8 lens, 7200 2.8 lens would give you. And here it is apples to apples, the best I can give you of the difference of f2 compared to 2.8. It is still one full stop difference, but it makes a lot of difference as far as what your depth of field and the compression is doing from 2.8 to f2. It's pretty amazing. And then here is the 200 at f11 and what I wanted to show this one for compared to some of the earlier f11s that we'll compare it to is that this is still getting really soft even though we're at f11 the depth of field is still shrinking and getting much much shallower because of the focal length in fact let's compare this 200 at f11 to 85 f11 and you can see the 85 has a lot more in focus back here and how much farther away that background and that wall looks like it goes compared to 200 at f11. So again, here's 200 f11 and 85 f11. Comparing f-stops to f-stops here at different focal lengths. 200 at f11, 85 at f11. And then now, let's look at the two kings of Boca, um, in my opinion, are the 200 at f2 compared to the 8514G. The depth of field still looks beautiful in both of these, but the main difference is going to be what the compression is doing to the backgrounds. Just look at the backgrounds and not her, because she's not changing that much, and the angle and everything is taken basically the same, and you can see what the difference is between the 8514 and what the 200F2 is getting. Now let's look at the 200 f2 compared to one of these wider angles, the 2428, where we're not getting much distortion still. And even though this is shot wide open at 28, the difference from what the 24 focal length gives you in compression compared to what the 200 millimeter focal length gives you in compression. She is basically the same size and basically the same spot, taking basically the same angle but the backgrounds are completely different mainly because of the compression and depth of field even though both of these lenses are shot wide open. So just because you shoot something wide open doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have a super shallow depth of field. A lot of that um, is going to be compared to what your lens focal length is going to be able to give you and provide you as well. I know that when I started um, as a photographer this is stuff that really um, confused me and I had a lot of trouble with understanding when to choose what lens and why to choose which lenses. Uh, again, I already said you're not going to use something like a 16 millimeter lens on a headshot um, because you're going to get all that weird distortion. But the longer your lens is, the more compression you're going to get, the more realistic uh, proportions you're going to get. Uh, it's just going to be a better, better for your close-up shots. Things like your 16 are going to work great for landscapes, for architecture, uh, for scene shots, maybe during a wedding. Um, but you're not going to use a 16 millimeter lens as a headshot lens. Um, 50 lenses, the Nifty 50 is normally geared to more of a um, three-quarter length or full length um, body shot, not for headshots. Not saying you can't, I think this one works just fine. Um, but the 50 compared to the 85 is going to give you a lot more compression and get rid of all that distortion completely. If you look at the 50, it still stretches it just a little bit. Not that anybody's probably going to notice that um, in the large scheme of things. Still a very sellable photo compared to the 85, though. We're losing all that distortion altogether. These lenses and the sample photos that you're seeing here are all also taken with um, the D800 Nikon camera, which is an FX body. If you were to take these same lenses and use them on a DX camera, such as a 7000, a 7100, um, or earlier models, you're going to need to magnify that with a 1.5 crop factor. So your 50 basically turns into an 85, so on and so forth. Um, 
So just because your lenses are giving you one effect on a DX camera doesn't mean that they're going to give you the same effect on an FX camera. Same thing with Canon, except I believe Canon is a 1.6 crop factor instead of a 1.5. Um, not enough to, uh, to write home about. Um, but the differences are really going to be noticed more on your wide angle side versus your zoom side of things. Um, so 24 is going to be basically a 35 millimeter lens, which is going to lose most of that distortion. Not quite back to the 50 here, um, but you can see what those uh, proportions are going to be doing now versus uh, what your focal lengths are doing. So what I've done is I've included a link under this video that will take you to this layered TIFF file to where you can go through, um, click on the photo, blink them on and off to see what the differences are and really start pixel peeping. All of these were straight out of camera. There's been zero editing done to any of them um, other than exporting them out of Lightroom. So things to notice when you're playing with this file is to look at the background of these awnings where the edge of the buildings end down here and what the cars are doing over here on the side, especially compared to the 1628 here compared to the 200 F2 down at the bottom. Just pretty night and day difference. This should help you understand when to use which lens and what effects on compression, depth of field, and distortion each perspective is going to give you. So as always, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me at Landon, L-A-N-D-O-N, at daydreamphotography.net, and I'll do my best to help you out and do what I can for you. Have a great day.